So now I'm becoming a scientist. I'm in college majoring in physics. I go to graduate school, get the PhD in astrophysics. It's my life love. I've known this since I was a kid. I didn't accidentally land at the Bronx High School of Science. I knew, but I wanted to become an astrophysicist not because I chose it. In a way, the universe chose me. That first day in the Hayden Planetarium at age nine, as a kid, and I looked up and the lights dimmed and the stars came out. And I was called by the universe. I had no choice in the matter. I became a student of the universe with the ambition of one day being one of its participants in research on the frontier of cosmic discovery. And that ambition, that inculcation, stayed with me the whole time. To the point where when you become an astrophysicist, when you become a scientist at all, here's what I'm putting back to you. Because you would go on pilgrimages to mountaintops, because that's where your telescopes are. And where is the mountain? The mountain is far away from any city because cities have lights and pollution and other things that interfere with your views. So by construct, the best telescopic observing sites are far removed from civilization, which means it takes at least four modes of transportation to get there. The plane, the train, the bus, the, 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 the all-terrain vehicle. Then you get to the mountaintop. And what do you have to do next? You have to then start going nocturnal. The day is now your night, and the night is your day. And so that's part of the pilgrimage. There's the effort of the travel, and then there's the effort of flipping your schedule and going nocturnal. Then there's the telescope itself, this conduit to the cosmos. It's a physical, it's a, it's a tube. It's a conduit. And I sit there and I reflect on it. My specialty was the center of the, of the Milky Way galaxy, 30,000 light years away. And so I have my digital detectors, I've got the telescope, it's dark, it's just me on this mountain and the universe. And I look up and I just think to myself, there are photons that have been traveling for 30,000 years. And I'm sort of snatching them from this journey and planting them into my digital detector. And then I started feeling bad for the photon and I said maybe it wanted to continue. But I got in its way. But then I said, no, those are probably happier photons than the one that slammed into the mountainside that will go unanalyzed and will not, will not contribute to the depth of our understanding of the universe. But so, so there's not only the fact that I'm on the mountaintop, there's the knowledge and the feeling that I'm reaching out to the universe with these methods and tools of science. And then add to that, the sum of 20th century knowledge about the origin of the chemical elements, something the chemist would not be able to answer without the help of the astrophysicist. You can't go to the chemist in your high school chemistry class and say, where did these elements come from? The teacher wouldn't know outside of the domain of science, uh, from within the domain of chemistry. That was informed by astrophysics. We can trace the elements. They were forged in the centers of stars, high mass stars that went unstable at the ends of their lives, they exploded, scattered their enriched contents across the galaxy, sprinkled into gas clouds that then collapsed and formed stars and planets and life. And so these ideas, these cosmic perspectives, this pilgrimage to the cosmos, there are people who say, this makes me feel small because I need to see the immensity of the cosmos. And I say, no, you're, you're not thinking about it the right way. You know, by the way, when we opened our facility, I got a letter from a psychologist from the University of Pennsylvania. He had seen our show, which was a zoom out from Earth, and Earth just shrinks to nothingness as you go to the edge of the universe. And he wrote me a letter that says, I'm a, I specialize in the psychological effects of things that make people feel insignificant. And I thought, bummer of a job. Man, is that what you do for a living? <laughs> And he, said, and he said, needless to say, your show was the greatest eliciter of feelings of smallness I have ever seen. Will you allow me to conduct a survey on the people who visit your show? And I thought to myself, there's something wrong here, because why does he feel small, but when I look up in the universe, I feel large. Then I realized the problem was his ego was too large to begin with. <laughs> he came to the problem thinking too highly of who and what he was to begin with. 
Because then everything that happened in the show destabilized his self-image. Whereas I know that the molecules in my body are traceable to phenomenon in the cosmos. And that, and it's our 15 pounds of gray matter that figured this out. There's a kinship with the cosmos that resonates deeply with new age thinking, but I'm not apologetic about that. It's what we find. If whatever we find is resonates with whoever, go ahead, take it. But what I want to know is, I want you got you, we're in one of the greatest centers of neuro, neurophysiology. I want somebody to put electrodes on my head. And when I reflect on our kinship with the cosmos, when I do the calculation, that shows that a 15-ton meteorite that we have in the center of the road center for Earth and space, it's an iron meteorite. When I do the calculation that shows that if you take all of the iron from the hemoglobin of the people in the tri-state area of New York City, you can recover that much iron out of their blood and realize that the iron from that meteorite and the iron from your blood has common origin in the core of a star. Tell me what part of my brain is lighting up because that excites me. That makes me want to grab people in the street and say, have you heard this? It's quite literally true that we are stardust. In the highest exalted way, one can use that phrase. And so I feel, and I use words, I bask in the majesty of the cosmos. I use words, compose sentences that sound like the sentences I hear out of people who had revelations of Jesus. I want someone to do that experiment because the day you do, if the same centers in my brain are excited by these cosmic thoughts as what are going on in the mind of a religious person, that's something to know. That's going to be really interesting finding because what that tells me as an educator is let me offer the universe to people and they'll start taking it in and they'll start achieving those feelings that they had before. And I don't so much care whether they abandon previous feelings. I've got an offering that keeps growing, that keeps becoming more majestic. When the Hubble telescope was announced that we were going to cancel the Hubble telescope, the greatest outcry to not do that was not the astrophysicists. It wasn't from within NASA. It was the public. It was all over the op-ed pages and the talk shows. The public took ownership of the Hubble Space Telescope because the universe was coming into their bedroom into the living room, onto their computer. They were a participant on the frontier of, the dis of discovery. And as far as I can tell, if you let them, let them know that it's not something that we're in the universe, but in fact, given the chemistry of it all and the nuclear physics of it all, not only are we in the universe, the universe is in us. And I don't know any deeper spiritual feeling than what that brings upon me. And I just wanted to leave you with those thoughts.